welcome to Midnight Stalker, a late night storytelling podcast. I'm your host, Jay Scoble. Small towns may be found all throughout the western United States. History, culture, and colorful individuals can be found in places like these. Visiting a ghost town can be exciting because of the history it preserves, the ghostly vibe it puts off, and the unique sense of going back in time it gives to visitors. Furthermore, many of these communities have strange legends, such as those involving Bigfoot, that are part of their folklore. Tonight, we will explore the relationship between Bigfoot and deserted communities, aka ghost towns. We're going to look at the background of both Bigfoot sightings and abandoned settlements to see if there's any connection between the two mysteries. Join me as we dive into the riddles and the legends of Bigfoot. Bigfoot has been the subject of urban legends and stories for generations. Bigfoot is said to be a large, strong, ape-like monster that lives in dark, forest areas and is seldom seen by humans. Bigfoot sightings have been recorded from all over the world. It has been speculated that Bigfoot might be as tall as 9 feet, have long, shaggy hair, and have a strong odor. Bigfoot has been the topic of several media works. Let's change to ghost towns for a second. Ghost towns have a rich history that has stroked people's interest for ages. America's first ghost towns spun up during the gold rush of the 1800s. Prospectors rushed to the rest in the quest of gold and silver during this period and many boom towns swiftly died out as their mines ran dry or their residents moved on to the next big find. The United States is home to hundreds of ghost towns, some of which have been restored and turned into tourist destinations, provide visitors a fascinating look into the past and the lives of the people who once lived there. Unusual animal sightings aren't the only strange occurrences found around ghost towns. There has also been a stream of unexplained disappearances. More and more individuals have disappeared without a trace when visiting an abandoned ghost town. Some have been discovered many days later in a confused state, a condition with no memory of the events surrounding the days past. Some of them were never heard from again. Some of the disappearances have been dubbed the work of Bigfoot, while others blame a supernatural force. And whether the reason is evident that something unusual is going on is up for you to decide. In the mountains, there are a lot of little settlements called ghost towns where reports of Bigfoot sightings are common. Even Native American tribes have told stories of similar monsters in their mythology, and they have been several reports of sightings of a Bigfoot hairy creature wandering through the woods. In fact, in October of 2021, a hiker claimed to have seen a big black figure in the woods. In spite of the lack of hard proof, people still continue to believe that Bigfoot, the monster, does really inhabit the mountains, the forest, lands all across this world. Many people think the fable monster is real even though no one has ever been able to outright prove it. Traces of the unknown animal such as footprints or unexplained noises in the night are all over the place. Overall, the Bigfoot and ghost town stories have yet to be truly resolved. Truth behind ghost towns and Bigfoot myths have been sought by many. Whether they are genuine or not, the legends of ghost towns and Bigfoot have fascinated people for decades. Tonight, I have a tale for you. I hope it will spark your curiosity, your encourage to think beyond the box. It is time for you to relax. 
I'm about to spin you a tale of Bigfoot lives in this ghost town. The world is yours when listening to an audiobook. Audible is the unrivaled market leader in spoken word media, such as audiobooks, podcasts, and more. Millions of people rely on it as their daily dose of motivation. Get a complimentary 30-day trial from Audible. See the show notes to learn more. There is a ghost town that only the most curious can find. The only way in or exit is no longer maintained. You'll need climbing skills at the intermediate level to even reach it. In this reason, the only time of year to even try is when the temperatures are high and the air is dry. It was mentioned once by my grandfather. The narrative was sketchy since granddad was never one to make stuff up if his memory was starting to fail him. It was a tale he had heard when he was a kid. The story takes place in the mountains, the site of an old abandoned mine. The tale also includes a creature that made its home in the woods. No, it wasn't a bear, and this was definitely not a wolf. Regardless of what it was, it was not willing to share the land with the miners and the new town that had been established to provide support for them. There was a slaughter. No one survived. Let me fill you in on a little background of how this story came to be. My girlfriend and I loved camping and hiking. We would spend weeks in the summers. On one of our camping trips, the forecast was spot on and the weather cooperated beautifully. We had a wonderful time living off the grid. On the final night, around a crackling fire, I informed her about an abandoned settlement. Her lungs filled with the narrative. We will go there if we get the chance, won't we? I applied. Yeah, sure. Winter was coming, and as unpleasant as winter may be, it is bearable, because what lies ahead in the spring, but even more so, what lies ahead in the summer. I was captivated by the season of summer, the thought of taking a few weeks off and going camping in the mountains. To be able to indulge in one's deepest desire is a rare and special gift. Freedom, without control, was spurred by the sun's warmth. The end of the long wait was in sight, and so our story begins of visiting this little abandoned ghost town. We went as far as our car could take us, weaving our way up between the mountains that had lost their winter snow caps and were now splattered with the shades of green, blue, and brown. My girlfriend pulled off to the side of a deserted gravel road and rode the vehicle to a halt. The sun's warmth was magnificent. The coolness of the mountain air was spectacular. With packs on our backs, we begin the ascent. From what we were told, there wasn't much of the old town remaining. The rangers that we had talked to located it on our map, although none of them had ever gone to that area. Knowing where to find it was not common knowledge. Only the tale of it was ever passed down through the generations. If my grandpa did not know the exact location, it would be a complete guess for us. He had earlier said that it was in the sky. His grin faded into thoughtfulness as I informed him of our trip. I told him we were inspired by his narrative. He warned me to take precaution. I assured him that everything would be okay. As we ascended, the spruce trees became more sparse. We climbed a rocky outcrop so my girlfriend could double check our location. Our progress was noticeable. Assuming we had favorable weather, we could make it by sundown. A couple of hours later and we knew we had lost time due to a diversion caused by an impassable section of steep, rocky face. A day had passed, and tomorrow would be the soonest we could get to it. We set up camp in a clearing from which we could see what we thought might be the town across the plain. The X mark on our chart was hidden by a clump of trees that seemed to be protecting themselves from the chilly night air. 
I was curious as to what we would discover. Most likely nothing, but still the thought. Maybe only a few ruins of a crude wooden shack. We both looked up at the sky and decided to start watching for falling stars. Sometime in the night, my girlfriend woke me up. Overhead, the mountains cast a shadow from the half moon. Her hushed voice spoke in short spurts. It took my sleepy little mind a little while to piece together what she was trying to say. There was a noise that she could hear, and a bunt and a rousing crack as if a tree limb had been split in half. Suddenly, the moonlight came out. With the moonlight so soft and silvery, I took her hand and walked. A golden light flashed in the sky towards the horizon. A candle flickering in a window was the effect it created. In this isolated location, however, there was neither a window nor a candle. I could only provide a general recommendation. Something was playing tricks on our eyes. It was an unusual setting that there may be a bunch of hunters gathered around a campfire. Whatever it was, we were safely out of harm's way. One thing to mention is that it was located along our intended route. Resuming our previous positions, we both went back to sleep. Time and again, I would wake up and open my right eye to see whether the light was still there. It was, and then I would drift back to sleep. We woke up and hardly said a word the next morning as we headed off in the direction of the abandoned settlement. I was hoping to find anything ordinary about the light we had seen the night before. The ashes of a bonfire or maybe the home of a hermit high in the mountains. I knew my girlfriend was thinking the same thing because she kept her gaze fixed on the woods in front of us. As we walked into the dense woods, the air became cooler. As the trees closed in, they completely blotted up all of the light. The hike was getting harder with our legs exposed and trying to protect ourselves from the scratches that stray branches were giving us. I became lost because my feet were naturally following the downward slope of the terrain. Both the map and the GPS were pulled out by my girlfriend. The GPS, for whatever reason, was not working, so she switched to using the paper map instead. As she was looking at the map, I took a few steps ahead before my boot smacked into something hard. When I looked down, I recoiled in horror. A wooden stake hammered into the stony ground. More started to appear. There was a clearing to my left with dozens of wooden crosses. They were scattered around in an unorganized fashion. In a weak and husky voice, I shouted to my girlfriend. Going through the cemetery, I tried to avoid the ground immediately in front of any of the crosses out of respect for the dead. An ancient belief I found difficult to shake. Crude boards nailed together, enough to read an encryption, names, and timestamps, and they all had the same date that I can make out. December 7th. 1891, the genocide my grandfather told me about. I started to reflect the remnants of the settlement, if any, must be near. When we reached the top of the hill, there it was. The town's ruins were located on a flat, stony plain. Some of the wooden homes were still standing, faded from the original hue. Some more buildings had their roofs and walls removed, leaving behind just a frail remnant of their former selves. A rusty red leg of mining equipment protruded above the rocks, and my gaze traveled up the slope and beyond. My girlfriend and I walked to the nearest residence and pushed on the door. With little effort, the door ripped from its frame and slammed the floor inside. Spruce needles from the area had fallen on the floor. She made the decision to go in. I decided to stay outside for a while, examining a set of grooves in the wood sliding. 
the edgers were all weathered in. I ran my fingertips over them, trying to imagine what would have caused them. This is awesome, she said. There was some truth to what she was saying. During the retreat back down the mountain, several residents left behind furniture, such as tables, chairs, bed frames, in addition to half-buried glass containers. We discovered very little else. We decided to make our base camp near the home that we were exploring. It was nearest to the cemetery. Next, we discovered an improvised stairway out of the rock and decided to ascend it. An A-frame with a dirt extraction bucket placed on rails and a few forgotten picks were all that was left of the mining equipment. A tunnel was bored through the ground and quickly descended into the abyss. All we could do was make educated guesses about how deep it was. I climbed the next hill and sat with my legs hanging over the edge of a tiny rock outcropping overlooking the valley below. The mountains out in the distance were a brilliant blue. We stayed until the sun dipped below the western mountains. We planned to set up tent in the abandoned settlement tonight and spend the next three days exploring it. We headed back down to where we decided to make our base camp. My red windbreaker was the first indication of disaster when I found it on the ground behind the ghost town next to the home that we were planning on camping near. Before we went, I remember stuffing it inside of my bag. My luggage had been tampered with by an unknown entity. That certainly wasn't the first occurrence of this happening. The squirrels and birds had done this previously. But I was certain that my jacket was buried somewhere deep in my backpack. Even the most determined squirrel wouldn't have been able to reach it. After thinking about it for a few seconds, a second possibility entered. And my chest began to pound. Bear! All of our equipment was ransacked. Our clothing and sleeping bags all over the place. Tiny gas burner had been tipped over. Two parallel rips ran the length of my bag from top to bottom, like the two grooves in the house that I was examining earlier. I stoked my palm over them. No, this wasn't a squirrel. My girlfriend took the handle of her black frying pan. Something had twisted it. She showed it to me. The structure had collapsed inward on itself. She grabbed hold of it and tugged and pulled at the metal to bend it back into form. It was impossible to bend back. There was a bear, I remarked. For that reason, it was an absolute need. I rummaged about my backpack trying to find the bear mace. My body stiffened up and my hands worked fiercely. Eventually, I located it in the spot where I had put it. At least it was still there. Footprints were found near where I was walking as I held my foot over the pattern, I saw how little my shoes seemed next to them. Furthermore, whatever made it way through our camp did so on two legs. There's no way that's true. Something or someone is playing with us. My girlfriend was looking at the prince carefully. We had never seen anything like that before. The sun had already set and the sky was becoming an orange hue. The light would be quickly disappeared. There was not many choices upon us. Whatever had been there before was gone now. Although we had intended to sleep beneath the stars in a tent, we ended up bringing our sleeping bags and mats inside one of the homes that still had a door on it. Because the mysterious creature prowling the woods nearby, we felt a little bit of sense of safety being inside this dwelling. There was no way that we were going to start a fire though. The evening clouds came in from the west. The air was gently blowing dampness in the air. Potential storms were anticipated and warned about. I poked my head out the window, but the sky was completely dark. All I could see was the fuzzy outline of the moon peeking out from behind some clouds. Our nerves were definitely on end. 
there was total darkness on the inside of this home. I placed the bare mace container by my bed and checked on it occasionally by palming it. We twitched and strained to listen to every rustle, every crack in the woods. I contemplated how we could make it through the night. I quickly apologized for suggesting we come here. She just shrugged it off with a chuckle. We'll make it out alive. And the experience would make for fantastic tales when we get back home. She spoke with a quiver in her voice though, and I knew she was just as concerned as I was. I don't remember when I went to sleep, but I was awakened by the dampness and the still darkness outside. The roof softly tapped as a little rain fell. There was a little leak coming down. The floor was wet, so I shifted my sleeping bag to a drier spot. Far off, the sound of thunder rolled deep and menacing. Then I heard another sound this time closer, a tremor in the woods. Not a flimsy branch, but rather something stronger. Then there was a loud, rumbling rumble. We listened carefully. I knew there was something afoot. Can we take the chance of turning on the flashlight? No. We had better keep still, keep quiet. The bear maze was tightly gripped in my fist. The beating on the roof became more fierce. The leak in the roof progressed to a steady drip, drip, drip. A lightning bolt lit up the sky, followed by a roar of thunder that rocked the old abandoned home we were held up in. Then the door opened. My throat suddenly opened up as well and I screamed. The door slammed into the wall and it swung back and forth in the increasing stone breeze. As my muscles froze in terror, I did nothing. Some rustling came from behind me, and I knew my girlfriend was getting ready to flee. Lightning struck again, illuminating her figure, confirming my suspicion. She grabbed the door and steadied herself. After the first burst of light, a second one came, and something stepped out into the opening. Despite its size and coloration, it was not a bear. When the lightning flashed again, it seemed to be standing still, but I immediately saw it moving toward the entrance. I screamed for the door to be closed. The door slammed shut. My girlfriend cried out, help me. Upon hearing her voice, my thoughts immediately shifted to high gear. In an effort to get to the door, I scrambled up and crashed into it. My legs and shoulders were braced against the weathered wood. What do you think? I made the inquiry. My mind was overrun by the feelings of guilt coming out. Here was actually my idea. I insisted that we spend the summer in this location. The option to travel to Mexico with her fellow college students was available to my girlfriend. She had felt obligated to make the trip here with me. I started picturing the cemetery and the graves there. All of them all in one day. Signs of a stone hand, scratches all over the house. The stories were accurate, at least with regards to some key points. It's clear that something once called this place home, something that had no interest in having humans occupy its habitat. My thoughts were interrupted by my girlfriend's voice. She was screaming in riddles. I felt as powerful as a toddler as the monster pushed against the door. When we pulled back, the door snapped shut again. The wood scratched my shoulder. Crack in the wood was easily detectable by touch. It was clear the door wouldn't be able to hold for much longer. The creature snorted and spat, its hot breath penetrating the gap in the door and blowing over my neck. Despite the heavy downpour, It made a second attempt to push, and that was it. When the door gave way beneath us, we crashed to the ground, sending shards of wood crashing to the ground with us. I crashed down hard on my right side. The bear mace container tumbled out of my hands and into the night.
I followed it by crawling on all fours, feeling my way in the dark and waiting to be lifted off the ground by my ankles. My girlfriend yelled at me from behind that Thane had captured her. My index finger nicked the canister's cold steel. At last, I felt it in my hands and I clumsily stood up. In the pits black, I could make out absolutely nothing. I had no bearing, the rain on the roof, the howling of the wind, and the snarling of the creature. I raised the mace to fire in blind, but waited just long enough for a flash of lightning to dance across the sky. In the corner, I could see the creature and my girlfriend. I leaped forward and sprayed. Then, darkness descended upon us once more. The creature cried out in distress as my girlfriend slammed to the ground at my feet. Then it was outside. I could hear the wet ground slosh beneath heavy feet, but then it stopped. We hadn't seen the last of him, not yet. I stumbled out into the pouring rain. My socks were drenched from the muddy, waterlogged ground. Dense, chilling rain poured down. The cold wind sucked all the heat from my body. The cold made me shudder. Possibly a second dose was sent it running for the woods. After the first one, I felt a hand on my bicep. In fact, it drew me in. Then the sky illuminated again. Our faces were very close together, human-like eyes, but with a strange twist. A heavy wet carpet of jet black hair. I sprayed him with the canister by pushing it toward his broad nose with my free hand. He raised both his hands and picked me up off the ground. In an instant, I was floating in the air. But then, gravity. The earth pulled me back down. There was a gradual desperation of wet footsteps. It had ran off to the woods. We waited for dawn in the house. We waited in the darkness. The rain gradually diminished to a light drizzle, and then it stopped altogether. We pounded on the shards of the broken door with our feet. Several wet and hazy footprints could be seen outside, partially covered by the mud. We packed up our belongings and set out for home. The cemetery's upright headstones drove home the point that we were exceptionally lucky. As we prepared to make our way down the rocky ridge, I glanced back up. It was dark, just the slither of the sun as it started to creep up over the mountains. But a single light shone on the hill where the abandoned settlement and cemetery was located. This was not an inviting beacon, rather it was a warning. Thank you for listening to The Midnight Stalker. If you haven't done so, please visit the show notes. And until next time, have a good night.